All right. Today is Monday, August 9th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I'd love to chat with you a little bit before we start, but I got a good one for you and a long one. And I'm already too late because I was busy in my other job. So here we go. In focus tonight, we're going to talk about the new Fed chairman. Meet Raphael Bostic. Then we're going to talk about Moderna because the stock has become a meme stock and it is beyond any rationale at all. You want to look at a meme chart? Look at Moderna's. And of course, we're going to talk about inflation, specifically the data we got in the morning today. And it is disturbing to say the least. But let's start with Mr. Raphael Boistick, the Fed president out of Atlanta. And looking at this picture, at first, I thought that he was wearing woman panties on his neck. But on a closer look, it is actually a very colorful mask. And why is Mr. Raphael Boistick of Atlanta the first contender to succeed Jerome Powell? Well, for one, he is the first African-American and openly gay Fed president ever. The first ever, for all time, the first African-American and openly gay. And in the Biden administration, this is called a twofer. Instead of throwing one bone to the woke crowd, we throw two in one. But before your hopes ride a little higher than they should about the change in uh, Raphael Boistick, perhaps he will bring change from the old regime of Jerome Powell, perhaps more sense to the monetary policy, or even having a free market once again with price discovery, and not inflating the wage and the wealth inequality gap by your policies. Hold your horses here, because this guy is Jerome Powell on steroids. Uh, your name appeared in a number of reports this week as a potential member of a Biden administration, either as a Treasury Secretary or head of the Federal Reserve. Are those jobs you'd be interested in? Besides the lip smack, did you guys catch the smirk on his face when she asked him, Fed president? All of a sudden, oh yeah, now we're talking. Let's watch it again. Uh, your name appeared in a number of reports this week as a potential member of a Biden administration, either as a Treasury Secretary or head of the Federal Reserve. Here it is. Oh yeah. Now you're talking, girl. Now I'm listening. This is what I've been looking for my entire life. Get Papa Jerome out and Papa Boystick in axios said ready for the chair about mr boystick now look at him uh, sitting on the throne waiting to print anxiously but this guy is not only skilled in printing he's also skilled in mental gymnastics matter of fact he won the gold medal in tokyo for the olympics of mental gymnastics you thought jerome is shady and vague watch this guy because he outperforms jerome powell in mental gymnastics. Jerome Powell is an amateur compared to this guy. And today, Boystick made a lot of headlines about his mental gymnastics, talking about tapering, dancing around the issue, giving the most vague guidelines ever. Jerome Powell needs to learn from this guy. Here it is. Boystick says, I think we're slightly accommodative, just slightly, a tiny bit, a touch. You know, a touch of about six trillion dollars. No biggie. Boystick says he thinks Fed could start to taper purchases between October and December, but open to moving it forward. So did we say August, excuse me, October and December? Well, it could be January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, and on, and on, and on. We don't know. We're open to opening about anything. We're opening about opening about opening, about thinking, about thinking, about thinking, about talking, about talking, about talking, about tapering. Fed's boy stick must be well beyond the crisis before rate hikes, but also monitoring prices. So we're going to watch the inflation and prices, but we're also going to watch for us to be well beyond the crisis. What does that mean? Fed Boystick says he is in the 2022 camp for rate hike start. Okay, this is hawkish. Boystick says he could back September tapering decision if jobs growth explosive like diarrhea. Hawkish. You sure you want the job, Mr. Boystick? With all this uh, hawkish talk? Boystick in favor of going relatively fast on tapering. Uh-oh, hawkish. What are you doing here, Boystick? But here it is, the mental gymnastics. Boystick, if Delta proves challenging, could push back taper the next year, or the year after, or the one after that, and on, 
and on and on. We're flexible here, folks. Expect the unexpected, but never doubt the printing. And how did Mr. Boystick, by the way, learn about all of these mental gymnastics? Perhaps his background offers an answer. Okay, so a base case outcome requires no response either way from the Fed. So a base case, out, well, it depends, right? So all of the, you know, I'm an economist, right? So it always depends. You, you need both hands and a few more, right? But, okay. but exactly. And here it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm an economist. I do bullshitting for a living. What is economics anyways? Some guy with uh, theories that might work or might not work. Flexible, just like the Fed, 50-50. And if you think that Mr. Boystick will offer a better alternative to Jerome Powell addressing our grievances against the Fed for the crimes that they're committing in the economy against the poor and the middle class? Not at all. Boystick is even worse than Jerome Powell. Listen to his views about the Fed's role in creating a stock market bubble, an asset bubble, the likes that we have never seen before. The biggest orgy in financial history. Listen to his views about the Fed's role. Now, I don't know about anything. We, we didn't do this. There are many other reasons for this uh, orgy that's going on in the markets these days. And by the way, before we start, watch the Ferrogian slip by Steve Leesman. Here comes Leesman once again, and he slips. Listen. What about the liquidity that's been injected by the Federal Reserve into the equity market? In, in, sorry, into the banking system. Uh, I, I jumped the gun on that. Um, has it had an effect, you think, in pumping up the stock market? I don't think so. Now, we've had a fair number of conversations about this uh, at our team. And, you know, one thing that um, we see and is that there has been this, this correlation. But correlation doesn't always equal causation. And there are a lot of other things that are happening as well. And here's Boystick. And by the way, what is with uh, Steve Leesman with the journalistic uh, questions? All of a sudden, Steve Leesman found his uh, journalistic balls. But here comes uh, Boystick and he says, correlation doesn't mean uh, causation. Could be this, could be that. It could be the wind causing the stock market bubble. Could be memes, could be dog shit. I don't know, many other reasons. And watch how Becky Quick catches him with a quick one right away. Not going to let you slip with this one. All of a sudden, CNBC got journalists. If it's not the liquidity that was injected, I mean, Jim Bullard made this, the point that if you're really looking to blame the Fed, look at the three rate cuts from last year, driving rates down across the board. Is that something that pushed a lot of money towards equities because there's no alternative and there's no yield anywhere? So that's possible. Again, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are going on to drive this. And here he is again. I'm going to spare you the agony of listening to his bullshit because he's going to play the mental gymnastics once again. The question was clear. The Fed's policies, in essence, the Fed is playing the traffic cop. And it is directing every penny in the country, from governments, pensions, retirees, every penny has to follow the stock market mania and buy assets at cartoonish valuations because the Fed made investing in the bond market for fools. You're going to hold uh, a government bond for what? No yield? Practically. And the value of your investment dwindles every day holding that bond. Boystick says, maybe, I don't know, perhaps, but there are other issues too. There are other causes. A causation doesn't mean correlation. Correlation doesn't mean causation. And let's just forget about it, okay? And listen to Boystick's views on inflation and the role that inflation plays in harming the poor and the middle class. He's gonna play the mental gymnastics once again to convince you that inflation is actually good for the poor and the middle class. And here is Steve Leesman once again after finding his journalistic balls. President Bostic, you and other Federal Reserve members have talked a lot about uh, inequality in the economy. But one thing I scratched my head over, and actually there's a story in the journal about this today, how does higher inflation help average workers and low-income workers? Don't economists such as yourself see inflation essentially as a regressive tax? Aren't, you, aren't we hurting uh, uh, regular workers by having higher inflation and aiming for higher inflation? So I actually look at it very differently than that. I, I actually think that having a healthy level of inflation is a sign that the economy is healthy, the economy is going to be dynamic and growing, and that should translate into jobs for the people who everyone is concerned about at the lower end of the wage distribution. So we don't have an economy that gets people employed so they can have jobs and get onto a more sustainable trajectory. Uh, then we're going to have a much more difficult problem to challenge, to, to face. So for me, I really take the inflation as a sign of a, of a healthy economy where there's growth, 
there's innovation, there's value add that's being provided. And that in turn should result in better fortunes for, for basically everyone in the economy. And this is, by the way, the same garbage we heard from Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, who says, yes, our policy contributes in making the rich richer and creating this massive wealth inequality gap. But it is worth it because this policy, oh, trickles a little bit, perhaps 1% or 2% in creating jobs for you bums. And if our policies result in some jobs created here and there, it is worth it. The side effect of making the rich richer, it is worth it. No, 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 no. The main effect of this garbage policy is to make the rich richer. The side effect is the trickling down of some jobs, mostly not even permanent. Garbage jobs, Amazon, let's deliver boxes kind of jobs. And then in the first instance of any economic downturn, poof, those jobs are gone. So is it really worth it, Mr. Kashkari, or Mr. Boystick? Let me turn to another area of the economy that you follow closely. You, decide, you describe yourself in one speech as a housing guy. And housing right now is in the middle of what seems to be an historic boom. How much do you worry that Fed policy is something that's fueling a boom and creating distortions in the economy? Well, I'm not worried about that so much right now. You know, the, the pandemic changed a lot of the dynamics in terms of housing supply in particular, and also some of the, the factors associated with, with new construction. So what we know in housing markets right now is that the amount, the number of homes that's available is far smaller than it historically is. And that means that the people who are looking to buy, um, they've got they're in an auction situation, and that's going to push prices up. As we come through the summer, I, I'm going to be paying close attention to what's happening in, in the lumber markets to see if that, uh, the price and the pressure is there. You know, lumber prices have, have tripled in the last several months. If that comes back down, then I think we will start to see uh, a lot more new construction. Uh, and then we will also see people uh, re-engage in their normal ways in housing markets, uh, start to sell their homes again. And I think and I'm hopeful that we will get a more rational market uh, in the months to come. But now things are tight and that means prices are going to be high. And here he is, Boystick. He hopes, let's hope that we're going to have a rational market once again. Well, we're not going to have it, Boystick, Raphael. We're not going to have it so long as the Fed continues to grease the market with more and more injections of cocaine. Every single day, billions and billions and billions of dollars. The market will remain irrational. And once that moment of rationality happens, Mr. Boystick, the market will crash 50% rapidly. So you better hope that we're going to stay in this irrational market forever and ever and ever. We know that Boystick now supports inflation. He thinks it's good for the poor and the middle class. So the question is, if inflation is rising all around us, wages are not keeping up with inflation. What is the reason behind low wages, Mr. Boystick? Listen to his ridiculous answer. Garbage absolute garbage. Well, the question, though, is why aren't wages overall rising given where we are with unemployment? Is there a lot of extra slack out there or have we just gotten used to a low wage environment? So I think it's actually a, a combination of a number of factors. When I first started this job two and a half years ago, yeah, I asked this question. I was a new guy. I hadn't <laughs> talked to businesses. So I was like, well, we got to find out why this is happening. Because if you're, if you're complaining about shortage of, of workers, Obviously, just pay them more, you'll, get, you'll, you'll compete better. And some of them said, look, I remember you know, seven years ago when I had to lay off you know, a third of my staff. That was so painful. I'm going to be very reticent to quickly take people on that way. Others said that, um, look, today's workers, many of them aren't looking for wages. They're looking for flexibility in the work schedule. They're looking to bring their pet to work. They're looking for a lot of different things to bring allow- Bring their pet to work? Oh yeah. That's get... a thing? Do you have your dog under Is the- it... <laughs> bring, bring, your, bring your, you got a cat? I do have a cat. How do you know I'm totally a cat person? I'm a cat person too, so we, we have that in common. You guys common. get it. But, but yeah, so, so finding ways to make people work in their comfortable environment, and, and that's something that, that's happened a lot, a lot as well. A third is on the consumer side. So consumers also remember from the Great Recession that you know the three desks next to them used to have people in it, and now they don't anymore. So let's just understand what he's saying here. He's saying you, as a worker, you're looking around to the three desks next to you, and they're empty. The workers are gone. They lost their jobs. You're next. Keep your mouth shut 
And don't ask for higher wages because you can be desk number four and you join the empty desks from one to three. This is the hope and progress that the Fed is gifting us. And listen to his views, his sinister views about wage inflation. The Fed says, you know what? We have a stock market bubble, who cares? We have a real estate bubble, who cares? Yes, it makes the rich richer, but it creates some jobs here and there sometimes. So it is worth it to make the rich richer. And if we have inflation, so be it. Inflation is good. It creates more job for the dummies and the poories and the bums, the freeloaders, the deadbeats. But what if inflation starts to touch our wages, Mr. Boystick, when our wages finally catch up with inflation? Listen to his answer. So, you know, we've been in a stimulative position for a long time. And I think the, the whole uh, impetus for going slow was that we wanted to make sure the economy had legs to stand on its own. I think we're there. I think we're getting a lot of signals to su suggest that's true. So if that's true, then we can just stay in the neutral position and then really just wait and, until we get some signal of directionality in the broader economy. Well, uh, the signal for many people would be that inflation starts to accelerate, but we're not seeing that. How concerned are you that that might happen? That, that inflation, inflation might accelerate? Might accelerate. Uh, it's something I'm watching. So, you know, I, when we talk to business contacts throughout our district, we're seeing more businesses and more employers say we're having to increase wages because we're struggling to find workers to fill our positions. And it's happening at, in segments that we hadn't heard before. We, we knew about nurses, we knew about truckers. Now I'm talking to people who run hotels, people who run restaurants, and they're also starting to feel wage pressure. Oh, if inflation touches your wages, God forbid now your wages are rising higher and you're getting paid more, an equitable rate to the rate of inflation. God forbid that happens and our corporate overlords have to pay you more. Uh, 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 we're going to end the show. We're going to taper now, raise interest rates right now, this moment. They did not mind the stock market bubble, the real estate bubble that make the rich richer. No problem at all. But when inflation touches our wages, uh, 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 we get a problem. This is the hope and change you're getting from Raphael Boystick when he replaces your own pal. And here is an interview from Axios with Raphael Boystick. Remember, he's uh, ready for the chair. And this is perhaps the best journalist in the country right now. And my prediction is, the guy's not going to last in the business. He's not going to last in this business, being honest. Wake up. But here he is. This brings me to another area of criticism that some folks have leveled at the Fed, which is the idea that the Fed's policies do little to actually reduce the inequality in terms of employment. They do a lot to increase the wealth inequality, which is increasing folks' portfolio prices, increasing stock prices, increasing housing prices. And that exacerbates the unevenness and the inequality of the economy. In order to be, play in that game, you have to have assets. If you don't have a job, there's no way you're going to get to assets. I want our institutions and I want our policies to work in a way that many more people get jobs than have historically, because then they can actually start to build those assets. Absolutely. So they can be in that game. And there it is. Raphael Boystick says, join the game, the game, join the casino. We, the Fed, we created this casino for you, you dummies. A casino where nobody loses. With, of course, a disclaimer, some very minor exceptions. But in this casino where nobody loses, you sit down, you have a good time, you place a bet, you lose, but they give you an extra chip anyways. And this is the game that Wall Street has been playing for years. If you win, you win. If you lose, you win too. Because the taxpayer will bail you out. And now Mr. Boystick's saying, you know what? Our policy is good, propping up the stock market, making the rich richer, because it trickles down, creating some of these jobs here and there. And you need a job to play in the casino. And if we can convince people to get jobs, your bums, go get jobs. We got a lot of jobs open right now. You get jobs, you're going to have the money to play in the casino, and then you're going to join the rich. You're going to play the same game that Wall Street is playing. We, the Fed, made this casino for you. Use it.
that. And this is perhaps the message that Raphael Boystick and I share in common, with an important difference, of course. In this channel, the purpose of this channel, among many other purposes, by the way, but one of the main purposes of creating this channel is to convince retail traders and investors, to convince regular people, specifically younger ones, to get involved and invest in the stock market. Because you have a job, you get paid every month, every week, it doesn't matter to me. You use some of that money, you save it in the bank. Where do you keep your money? Under the mattress? In the bank? If it is in the bank, you're losing value. The money is depreciating in value as we speak. And the only game, quote unquote game, to quote Boystick, is the stock market. You want to create wealth? You want to achieve financial independence? Well, the only way is to join the stock market. Join the casino. Play the game. The problem is, Mr. Boystick, there is zero proof that your policy of making the rich richer by creating this casino actually results in creating jobs so those people who get those jobs can join the casino. It is a psychopath kind of theory. Let's create a casino, create the biggest wealth inequality gap in history. So hopefully we can create some jobs and those bums get the jobs and then they join the casino and they become rich too. The dumbest idea ever. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we say this is the greatest experiment in financial history and it will end in a disaster. Continuing with Boystick. I don't think anyone disputes that, that that's what you all want. Or but but, I, th to but I think they do because, because for us to succeed in the job side, there's also going to be success on the wealth side. You can't get one without the other. Is there a thought given to our policies aren't working the way they used to because the economy doesn't work the way it used to? It used to be that when we lowered interest rates, businesses hired workers. Now when interest rates get lower and businesses can just borrow money to load up their, their balance sheet with cash and they enrich the people at the top, the C-suite executives. And it exacerbates inequality and the unevenness of the economy that you talked about. I have a different narrative. I actually, I, I think that um, my focus is on first principles, which is try to get as many people a job as possible. I do think that the goal in a pandemic is to try to create a bridge for every business and every family to get to the other side with as little damage as possible. Because it does seem like as long as what the Fed does is what Wall Street wants, then the Fed is willing to do as much as it takes, as long as it takes. I don't do what Wall Street wants. I do what's best for the economy. And, and you know, if Wall Street has an investment in that economy, if the economy grows and they do better, and so be it. And there it is. So be it. So be it. If distorting asset prices all over the place, making the rich richer by propping up the stock market and the real estate market, if that is the cost to create some jobs, so be it. You gotta be an absolute moron to believe this garbage. Is this the only way to create jobs, Mr. Boystick? How about we try another alternative, a bottom-up approach of creating jobs. Of course, you're not interested in that because this is not your mandate. The Fed's mandate is to preserve, protect, and inflate the assets of the wealthy, stocks and real estate. This is their main and only mandate. And here is the moral of the story, by the way, a question about inequality, specifically for the black community. According to the Fed, only 34% of black households own stocks. You've been writing and speaking a lot lately about uh, widening inequality in this country. What needs to be done about it? And I'll spare you the agony of the mental gymnastics from Boystick, and I'll answer the question for you. Boystick says, too bad. Black people should uh, get some jobs. Move your asses, you bums. Get some jobs make some money, and join the casino. Play the game that we created for you, that we have created for Wall Street for years and years and years. Now this game is available to you. Here's the problem, Mr. Boystick. The job that you're offering me is a garbage job that pays nothing. I can barely live on the wage. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Where do you think I'm going to find this money to play in the casino and quote-unquote play the game when the majority of my income is going to pay rent because the prices of rent and real estate are in bubble territory, out of whack, pricing the majority of Americans out of the market? 
thank you to the Federal Reserve. You want me to play the game with what? This is absolute insanity, and Raphael Boystick will represent zero progress at all from Jerome Powell. If anything, he will represent regression because this man is even more radical than Jerome Powell. Moving on to the next story of Moderna and Delta. You cannot talk about one without the other. You might have noticed that Moderna's stock is trading in La La Land, up double digits today alone. This is uh, what Boystick calls, so be it, so be it. If people pump up the stock higher to cartoonish valuations, so the executives like CEO Stefan Bensel can dump hundreds of millions of dollars and become rich, while the morons chasing this mania will hold the bank. This is just a normal day in the quote-unquote the game. And of course the stock is moving based on options activities, but not just from us retail traders and investors. They're saying that this is retail, all retail, retail mania. Well the stock is trading above 400 bucks. The options are extremely expensive. Excuse me, but I don't think retail is responsible for this 100%. Yes, some are participating, but these are games played by hedge funds and the Wall Streeters. They create these pumps, then these stocks become meme stocks and they become popular in Wall Street bets and the likes. Then the retail morons join and the early entrants who sparked the mania, the hedges and the likes, they dump, leaving us retail holding the bag. When you have options for this name, trading an average of 22 bucks, 25 bucks, this is an expensive trade. You gotta have millions of dollars to play this quote-unquote game with Moderna. It's not us retail doing it, by the way. Some were responsible for some, but these are games played by Wall Street. And the insanity doesn't stop here. Moderna stock is about to exceed the valuation of the old-school pharmaceutical company called Pfizer. Moderna will worth more than Pfizer. This is what the Fed calls normal functioning market. And by the way, is there any fundamental story backing the move in Moderna stock? They're saying it is the boosters. The boosters are coming. The boosters. They're coming. And the reason is, I'm looking at the UK as a leading indicator for Delta regarding the situation here in the USA. Cases in the United Kingdom have been declining, but it looks like COVID is buying the dip here. The silver lining is that the number of fatalities is not increasing at all. Perhaps the benefits of the vaccine are showing up here. So do we need another booster shot? Perhaps not if the fatality cases don't rise. So this is just another mania based on options gambling, based on hedges pumping and dumping. And you wonder why people have vaccine hesitancy. When you look at a stock like Moderna rising significantly higher, and the government is allowing these pharma executives to dump stocks are making billions and billions of dollars from pumping and dumping these stocks, profiting from the tragedy. Any company that wanted to be involved in the vaccine development should have agreed ahead of time no dumping of stock for at least a year to give the public faith that this is done not for profit, but to address the pandemic and the tragedy. Of course, they did not, and these big pharma executives made billions and billions and billions of dollars. And it's not just the lack of faith of big pharma that is causing vaccine hesitancy. It is also the lack of transparency regarding the data. Why are we not allowed to look at the data for breakthrough cases, for example, to develop statistics and understand whether we need a booster shot or not? Of course, the Biden's propaganda minister, Saki, she says, why do you need that information? Did you forget we're living in North Korea? Impact of individuals who may have, as you said, breakthrough cases. But why not just provide the number? Are you trying to hide something? No, but what is the, why do you need to have that information? In case of transparency, the interest of public, blowing, under... And here is Axios asking the CDC, where is the data? No transparency at all. And of course, I have to do the obligatory. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. Because we have two cults in this country, the blue cult and the red cult. If you talk about one but not the other, you're accused of being biased. We're moving on to the third main story of the day, the story of inflation and tapering. In the morning, we got the number for jobs openings over 10 
million jobs available right now. You get a job, you get a job, he gets a job, she gets a job, everybody gets a job. All your horses, nobody wants a job. We now have more jobs than people looking for jobs. We talk about shortages, shortage of this, shortage of that, but there is no shortage of jobs, that I can tell you. And that raises the question. Federal Jerome Powell says, I'm waiting for further substantial progress and maximum employment before I start tapering. Somebody please send this chart to the Federal Reserve, to Jerome Powell, stick it in his face and say, if this is not maximum employment, then what is, Mr. Powell? We have more jobs than we have people looking for jobs. And this is causing more and more inflation. We got the data from China. And inflation in China is also rising significantly higher due to the rise of commodity prices. Matter of fact, inflation is rising everywhere. And the blind spot in the mirror that these genius economists, economists miss is the role of psychology in inflation. It is called inflation expectations. Psychology alone could give birth to inflation. The role of psychology is underappreciated in the study of inflation. And now inflation expectations, according to the New York Fed, for the next year exceeding 4% almost to 5%. This is us consumers. The role of psychology. We're expecting inflation to be above 4%, almost to 5% in a year range. The Fed says it's going to be 2% on average. The consumer is expecting 5%. Never underestimate the role of psychology in creating and maintaining inflation. And after the bell, we got the big bomb out of the Boston Fed. President Rosenberg is now agreeing with tapering by saying perhaps tapering should be announced as soon as September. Remember, the Fed says we're going to give you advance warning. Plenty of time for you to leave the casino, to leave the dance floor before we start tapering. Trust us. We'll give you the advance warning ahead of time. My question is to Rosenberg, excuse me, Rosengren, is this the advance warning? Because if you guys announce tapering in September, the market will crash right there. So much for advance warning. So is this the warning, Mr. Rosengren, or what? And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to covering the market's information today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the red. Down 106.66 points or a decline of 0.30%. The Nasdaq closing in the green by 24.48 points or a gain of 0.16%. The SPY closing in the red down 4.17 points or a decline of 0.09%. The leading sectors of the market today, number one, healthcare, capturing the gold medal. Communication services for number two and the silver medal. For number three in the bronze, consumer defensives. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by energy, industrials, and REITs. We talked about the rise of the U.S. dollar due to tapering. This will hurt commodities, will hurt industrials, it will hurt materials, energy, and the market will be in a state of confusion to decide what sector of the market it should favor next. In the meantime, the internals of the market, NYSE, 39% advancing versus 58% declining. The Nasdaq, 51% advancing versus 47% declining. Slightly better for the Nasdaq, but still the market is cautious. Doesn't want to move one way or the other. Gathering of energy before a massive pop one way or the other. What about futures? What's going on here? We talked about the rise of the US dollar. It's not going to be good for commodities here. Therefore, not all the inflationary trade will be in favor. Perhaps it's going to be limited to financials. Who knows? We're going to see how the market processes the information by the day. A down day, big one for oil, lumber, gold, silver, copper, even lean hogs getting slaughtered today. Meanwhile, grains futures muted for the most part, with exception of rough rice futures, and of course, coffee futures. At performing today, we talked about the shortage of coffee beans in Brazil, the weather, the extremes, you know the story. Moving on to the big casino, the options market. Here it is. Apple at number one with about 660,000 contracts. About 73.5% of those were calls. Tesla at number two. Notice the implied volatility. Nobody wants Tesla options all of a sudden. They're cheap, cheap means opportunity. Tesla closing with about half a million contracts. 
traded for the name today, about 62% of those were calls. AMD at number 3 with about half a million contracts, traded for the name today, about 65% of those were calls. And notice the elevated activities for Moderna stock, MRNA, the implied volatility for the name, has surged significantly higher meaning that the opportunity of trading options for this name is perhaps past us because the premiums are expensive but the premiums for tesla not so expensive what about the unusual trades that took place in the options market today starting with the ticker snap snapchat they bought the 83 calls with the expiration date of august 20th seeking an upside of about six and a half percent or more by then they paid about a buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 1.8 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker mara for marathon tulips the buying calls on the heels of the rise of btc bitcoin and the rest of the crypto market they bought the 40 calls with the expiration date of this upcoming friday notice the short term scope in these trades traders and participants cannot foresee where the market is going up or down lots of uncertainty regarding tapering and where we go from here and therefore they're playing these options with very short term scopes they're expecting mara to rise by over 11 percent by the end of the week they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about one and a half million dollars what about the ticker mrna moderna we have two trades here perhaps a strangle trade the trader is expecting a huge move to come a massive one but they're not sure about the direction they have a bias and this bias to the downside and therefore it is a strangle trade they bought the 550 calls with the expiration date of august 13th meaning this upcoming friday they paid about five bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about five million dollars in buying these calls and then they bought the puts the 450 puts with the expiration date this upcoming friday they paid about eight and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all the total entry cost for this trade is 13 and a half million dollars either i'm reading this right or i'm too high a massive bet here and when we talk about the retail participation in the moderna mania tell me again which retail trader is spending 13 and a half million dollars in an options trade that's going to expire this upcoming friday what about the trade for the ticker qqq the triple q's the nasdaq they're making bearish bets here betting for a downside for the nasdaq by buying the 345 puts expiration date september 24th with expectations that the nasdaq will drop by over six and a half percent by then they paid about three bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three million dollars what about the trade for the ticker amc for you guessed it amc the name reported earnings after hours and it is popping about four to five percent last time i checked and here we have a trader who bought the 36 calls with the expiration date of this upcoming friday this is an earnings play for this trader looking for an upside of about six percent so if the stock opens up tomorrow up three four percent or even down this trader will lose money even if the stock opens up three to four percent in the green and the reason is they paid too much for the premium they need a large move 10 15 20 percent they paid about two bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade remember the expiration date is this upcoming friday two bucks and 20 cents a piece which is 220 bucks per contract adding it all up and we get 1.7 million dollars spent on this trade alone lastly what about the trade for the ticker mu micron we talked about this name positively in this channel before indicating that the chart is starting to look bullish primed for a bullish breakout but i also cautioned that the gamma squeeze in amc will come to an end amc will go down and it will drag micron down with it this doesn't change my outlook or my opinion about the stock but perhaps we're going to see more downside here before the stock trades higher at least according to this trade alone they bought the 76 puts expiration date august 27th with expectations that the name will drop by over five percent by then they paid about 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about six hundred thousand dollars we're skipping the heat map analysis because we're themeless 
We don't have a theme today. The market is moving solely based on the options market activities. So we're moving on to charts right away, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. And we've been looking in this uh, line chart. Unlike a bar chart, you can see the trading range, the consolidation box clearly. The chart is trading away from the consolidation box to the upside. This is bullish, not bearish behavior. But the devil's advocate is, what if this a false breakout higher from the consolidation range? And the chart will go down trading in the consolidation range once again. We have seen this kind of behavior. Look no further than the chart of Amazon. So are we about to see a similar scenario here in the SPY? from a 30 minutes perspective perhaps we need to move on to the daily chart of the continuous contract for the spy to shed more light there is nothing wrong with this chart at all from a candlestick pattern it remains bullish we have a bull flag consolidation it is trading above the last support of 4385 yes we have a slight negative divergence in the spy excuse me in the rsi and we have somewhat of a moderation of the momentum in the chart from a MACD perspective. Folks, we have an imminent breakout that's about to happen in this chart. Will it be to the upside? Will it be to the downside? The guy you're listening to right now is still giving it the thumbs down. Due to other factors, of course, beside the technicals. Regardless, we have a break imminently in this chart. What about the cues? We have a line chart here, 30 minutes chart, still trading within the channel, defined peaks and defined valleys. It is trading in the mid range of the channel, but the bias is still to the upside. The chart is trading above the last support lines in 30, 365 and a half, and there is nothing wrong looking at this chart at all. It is making higher highs and higher lows, at least for now, until and unless this pattern is violated. We cannot say, looking at this chart alone, that the cues has turned bearish or we should short the cues you cannot see anything from a 30 minutes perspective perhaps when we switch out to a daily chart perspective for the continuous contract on the nasdaq for the bulls, the chart today defended the 15,000 threshold with success, bouncing higher. The chart is still in a bullish candlestick formation. The problem is that the momentum indicators are casting doubt on the bullish outlook from a candlestick pattern alone. We have negative divergence in the RSI. We also have a weakening in the momentum from a MACD perspective. For now, if you had to lay a bet, would you go would you go with the candlestick pattern or would you go with the momentum indicators or would you use your head and factor in the rise of bond yields for example if we see another explosive move higher to 1.4 or 1.5 by the end of the week you bet the nasdaq will get hammered on the head and we will see a flush down the momentum indicators win in this scenario what about the iwm Russell 2000, small caps. We were optimistic in the morning that the IWM is bouncing higher and it is attempting to recapture 223 for support. But this did not happen. The Russell 2000 finally succumbed to the resistance of 223. It gave it a good shot, but at the end of the day, it flushed down closing below the resistance line of 223 as if the chart is saying, I give up. I'm not ready to fight this fight. I need to go down, recapture some energy, and then resume the fight with 223. And this makes the destination at 218. This is the maximum 218 should hold. The IWM doesn't need to go all the way down to 218, but it needs to go down to gather some energy enough to break above 223. What about the Dixie? What's going on here? Blasting higher in anticipation of tapering. And the statement from Rosengren after the bell, of course, he waited till the market was closed and then he dropped the bomb. But Rosengren will add fuel to the fire in the rally of the United States dollar. And this will be bad for gold, oil, copper, the commodities market in general. Gold, massive, historic flush down. The good news is the chart managed to bounce from the Fibonacci retracement level support. But it doesn't look good here. So long as the Dixie continues to rise higher, we will see more pain for gold. By the way, gold is being outnumbered here. Gold has three enemies, really. Number one, the US dollar. Number two, yields. Number three, BTC, Bitcoin. All three are rising higher today. And therefore, you're seeing the massive beatdown 
that gold is taking. And here it is, the chart of yields, the 10-year treasury yield. Double bottom playing out impulsively higher. We have a resistance zone. We have a resistance line, a descending line. If the chart breaks above all of that in a single shot, we will see a scare 100%, a massive flush down specifically in the growth names. And this is the weekly chart for the TLT bond prices. It is starting to look as a reversal candle weekly perspective but it doesn't mean that the rally in the tlt is over we could see the formation of a cup and handle from a weekly perspective it will take time in the meantime yields will continue to rise higher while the tlt forms the handle what about apple what's going on here no update at all trading within range support 145 resistance 150 this boring activities in a chart like this it is pretty much an options premium killer because the decay of the premiums of options you're holding on apple this is death to gamma but one man's garbage is another man's treasure this boring activities in the chart of Apple means that the premiums on the options for Apple have been reduced significantly and that presents an opportunity to start building options positions in this name up or down doesn't matter to me you do you as they say what about Tesla the souffle what's going on here look at that massive bear flag excuse me bear trap the bears bought a lot of puts on Friday that the souffle will melt it failed to knock above 720 it's gonna go down it's gonna close the gap i told you to hold your horses hold your horses the chart is showing a lot of strength here and now we have a bull flag formation and the likelihood is tesla gathered enough energy to break above 720 unless we see a massive spike in yields tomorrow where growth stocks crash and tesla of course among them is a growth stock it is the most ridiculously valued stock in the market right now then tesla will flush down absent of that the formation of the chart right now is bullish indicating a break higher above 720 and i told you wait for the signals your bull wait till you break above 720 you're not going to lose anything waiting here if you are a bear wait for the chart to go to the gap closing the gap and then closing below the gap for the day what about the vix what's going on here four hours chart we're anticipating and awaiting the third attempt for the VIX to break above 20. On last night's video, I described the action in the VIX chart as a bull trap, market bulls, or those betting against volatility. And right away, you're seeing the VIX popping higher in the morning today. A similar behavior to the chart of Tesla, by the way. So we're now waiting and waiting for the VIX to give it the third shot, the final shot to break above 20. And if it does, we will see the SPY flushing down. BTC, tulips, what's going on here? Trading well above 42,000. The breakout is here. We have an ABC pattern and the next resistance will be at around 50,000. So plenty of room to go here for tulips higher. And we have a few catalysts that will impact the price of Bitcoin in the upcoming days. Number one, we have the infrastructure bill. Are they resolving the conflict with Bitcoin? Number two, we have the earnings of Coinbase. And this is coming out tomorrow. It will impact the price of Bitcoin. We also have this search. We're searching and searching for the next theme in investing this year. Where do we go next? Because a combination of a higher US dollar and higher yields is a lethal combination for the stock market. Which stocks thrive under this environment? Certainly not going to be technology and it's not going to be oil, materials, industrials. So which one is it? Perhaps the answer is you store money for now in tulips. And if that test is passed, you will see more confidence in investing in cryptos in general, not just BTC. What about AMC? What's going on here? Again, the earnings were bad. We already knew that. Now, there are some surprises, if you can call them that, in the report. AMC is announcing the use of cryptos and Bitcoin in general. They're talking about collaboration with GameStop. In other words, the executives of AMC are trying to milk these donkeys or apes, whatever you want to call them, for whatever they're worth. They know that this is a retail stock now. Retail owns about 80% of the stock, with only 15% shorted, by the way. So this whole, uh, the holy short squeeze is about to happen. AMC will go to 100,000K, bro. Not going to happen. Only 15% of the float is shorted. And at some point, they're going to get bored 
the stock is not going to move anymore. 1A pushes the button and triggers the domino effect to the downside. The only thing that will ignite energy in the stock and push it higher because it is a pyramid scheme. New blood. You need new blood to buy AMC to push it higher. Pyramid scheme. You do that by creating volatile moves sharply higher in the name via gamma squeezes and mechanical manipulation of the stock. If you do that and you blood waiting in the sidelines watches AMC popping higher 10, 20, 30 percent a day, they're gonna say, Oh, here we go again. Here we go. We don't want to miss out this time around. FOMO, let's go, pyramid scheme, stock shoots up higher, and then it crashes right away. As old apes dump on the heads of new apes. Lastly, by popular demand, because we're seeing a massive flush down in oil. What about the chart of WTI? I showed you this chart before. We covered this chart and we covered the chart of the XOP. I have the same drawings. Did not change anything at all. My outlook was a correction after a massive leg higher to retouch the descending line of resistance, now supposedly support, and then bouncing higher. If the chart fails to bounce, then we get a problem. But if the price bounces, then we have another leg in the rally in crude oil prices. And this was a mere stop, profit taking, gathering of energy, inviting new buyers to go long crude. Lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar? Tomorrow, we have the small business index and unit labor cost. These will be important regarding inflation and the recovery, specifically in small businesses. What about the earnings calendar? We have SoftBank. This will happen overnight in Japan. Then we have Coinbase, Weight Watchers, and Poshmark. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of this video because this is all I got for you for now. But I will talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you for watching. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.